Hello, everyone, and welcome back to an all new episode of the Financial Confessions. It's me, your host, Chelsea Fagan, founder and CEO of The Financial Diet and woman who loves talking about money. And it's a bit unusual that I'm coming to you guys here today because you're in the middle of a delectable second season of our podcast, Too Good To Be True, which I produce uh, and is my favorite perfect child. And you might be thinking, what? I was expecting another excellent uh, deep dive podcast on financial scams and hucksters. Uh, And you will be getting them. We have four more left in the pipeline, but I am popping in in the middle of our run of season two uh, to talk with one of the co-hosts of Too Good To Be True and a very dear friend of mine and dear friend to the channel, Ryan Houlihan, to talk all about what's going on on this season, do a little bit of a deeper dive, and talk about other follies in YouTube that we'll get into. It's very exciting. We've shared some of these videos already on the channel and there will be more to come. Um, But because you guys already know us, you're very familiar with uh, both of our work and hopefully have been in enjoying the hell out of this season of Too Good To Be True. Let's not waste any more time and just say hello to Ryan Houlihan. Hello. 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 I'd like to thank Nutrafol for supporting TFC. Nutrafol is the number one dermatologist recommended hair growth supplement. You can grow thicker, healthier hair and support TFC by going to Nutrafol.com and entering the promo code TFC to save $10 off your first month subscription plus free shipping on every order. And thanks to ZocDoc for supporting TFC. ZocDoc is the only free app that lets you find and book doctors who take your insurance and are available when you need them. Go to ZocDoc.com TFC and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top rated doctor today. Welcome back. I'm so excited to be here. I want my like SNL five timers club. I know. I don't know if it's been five times. We got to do scout badges. <laughs> um, okay. So I sort of alluded to it, but uh, aside from Too Good to Be True, uh, our master work here at TFD, you also have your own channel. I do. I do have my own channel. Um, I, it's at Ryho, R-Y-H-O. Ryho. Um, I'm using, I have at Ryan Houlihan, but that feels like for me you know what I mean that's where the algorithm is trained to bring me things right but the professional channel is at Raiho um it is me and drag doing journalism on a variety of different topics hopefully delivering some kind of reveal or twist at the end as all good drag performances do Absolutely. And I have to say, we did post it on the community page, but it's worth shouting out again. One of the most recent videos is Oops, AI Did It Again, How Britney Spears Created a New Hollywood. And aside from being a truly fantastic YouTube title, it is also such a good video. I was beyond honored and delighted to be able to give some notes on an earlier draft. And it is mwah, mwah, chef's kiss. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really proud of it. I, I started doing YouTube because I wanted to own my own content, but I also realized like I wanted to be able to make whatever I want and not have to explain it and justify it to some like editor in chief or like content like authority or even like advertisers at this stage of YouTube. I don't I don't need to I can say whatever I want. And one of the ideas I've always wanted to pursue was um, if you know anything about Britney Spears, she has lost a lot of agency around her own work increasingly through her lifetime until recently. And I always thought it was really interesting that the public kind of perceived that, but they blamed her for that environment when it is really about like systems and capitalism. And so the piece itself gets into like what's happening with AI. And like at this point in history, if you think pop stars had to fight to, you know, have artistic control in the past, it's about to get really, really bad for mm. creatives and artists. So kind of through that lens, I was like, what has Hollywood done when they had total control over someone, like legally, like make all career decisions for somebody? What do they do? And what do they do to child stars? How do they brand them? And um, if we look at the pattern of how Hollywood uses and abuses creatives, AI is just going to create a situation where they can say whatever they want, do whatever they want. You pe- buy people's images off of them, advertise whatever they want in anyone's mouths. It's creepy. So you can check that out for a good time. <laughs> and a lot of Britney jokes. So in addition to that, we're also uh, in the middle of a season of Too Good To Be True. Yes, we are. I'm so excited about all the topics we're doing this season. So which of the topics uh, from this season is your favorite? Well, my baby topic is timeshares and Walt Disney World. Um, If anyone knows about the Disney Vacation Club, we will be demystifying the math that they've heavily mystified to try to get you to sign up. Before we jump into it, and obviously we are going to dive into this quite substantially um, in the episode, but just for real quick top line, what is a timeshare? 
A timeshare, as proposed to the customer, is a portion of a vacation, generally a vacation home. And so you are buying time within the ownership of the home. Sometimes you're given like one whatever, one, you know, 30 second of the space, one uh, share, but you're purchasing that. Uh, nowadays, they get more complicated. You buy points that you can spend on vacations, but essentially you're tied to one home resort and that portion of time within that resort. To do that and to make it make financial sense for those places, you're paying every year for that. Right. So you're basically, and they have either fixed or flexible. So you can do like you get, you know, the week of June 13th every single year at this resort. Or you could have flexible ones where it's like you get to sort of pick the year. Usually those are a lot more expensive. There's a lot of, you know, there fees, are- so many fees. You, you Timeshare is a central part of that is fees. And even when considering if you, if you, if you are given all the warnings that it is a scam and you still want to sign up for a timeshare, you have to take into account the amount of fees they'll be charging you because it's thousands and thousands of dollars. It's not inconsiderable percentage of what you're paying on top of what you're paying. Totally. Um, for those who may not know, uh, can you talk a little bit about what the Disney Vacation Club is? Sure. So the Disney Vacation Club is a timeshare program that has been branded and marketed by Disney as for VIPs, insiders, special D- Disney adults, super fans. Um, and what it really is is a timeshare that you sign up for that purchases for you in perpetuity over a really long period points that you can then exchange for Disney vacations. Um, But you need to buy into a specific resort hotel like you would a timeshare. Got it. Um, And we will be releasing the episode about timeshares in the Disney Vacation Club very soon. It is also, I have to say, one of my favorites. But what's really interesting about that episode is that you and your co-host, Julia, go through an actual kind of sales exercise for one of these timeshare salespeople. Now, obviously, the Disney Vacation Club is just sort of like one iteration, and we sort of argue that it's almost worse because it has an entire point system kind of placed on top of the usual rental transaction, which is already often quite exploitative. But I think a lot of people don't understand the extent to which the sales process for timeshares is so fine-tuned and so specifically targeting a, a specific kind of customer. I mean, basically, when you get one of those jobs, what your main task is, is to memorize a book that is like a choose your own adventure so that you are like a living algorithm. And so that the person that you meet, no matter what their response is, may be, you have a a perfectly designed script that has been like studied to statistically get the right response out of them. And that is a really overwhelming sales environment for most people because people will say to you all the time, advertising doesn't work on me because I'm, I'm aware that it's advertising. And like, yeah, they know. They took that into account. It it works. That's it's working been, so hard you don't know. It's already been folded into the process. Well, and it's also like I think a lot of people also don't realize how much the industry and this is interesting because you sort of saw the same thing happening with the subprime mortgage crisis wherein a lot of the same targeting and tactics that have been used for years on timeshares which are at the end of the day usually a losing financial proposition specifically targeted couples and couples who could not afford them because they were sort of by definition couples who were often struggling to pay for vacations they couldn't necessarily go out of pocket for a hotel every year And the salespeople pretty overtly know that these people will probably not be able to afford to make payments long term, that it won't be a good financial proposition for them. And it is interesting how much those same tactics were used during the subprime mortgage crisis of like, oh, this will be amazing. No credit check, no no nothing. You don't have to put any money down. We'll get you into this mortgage. And they got paid off of that. They got their commission off the mortgage and then they were on their merry way. I mean, I think what's interesting in the way that Disney has really gotten to people is to say, like, this is for super fans, people that just want to come back to Disney all the time. So, like, lots of people don't sign up for for this because they're not Disney super fans. Timeshares more broadly mostly say, like, you know, this is a way to have a vacation home and rich people have vacation homes. So is this kind of your version? And it's an investment and your kids will inherit it without, like you know, really understanding that you're getting a week at a specific venue once a year usually, maybe two weeks in, in exchange for really expensive prices. And and if 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 it was a good enough arrangement, 
I think a lot, you would see a lot of really wealthy people with timeshares, like really yeah. wealthy people, but you don't hear about Jeff Bezos with a timeshare. No, and especially now that there's such a proliferation of Airbnb and VRBOs, like if you want to have a week in your life, I'm not saying verbo, I won't say it. Uh, we, did, we talked about this in the last video. Um, like if you want to spend a week in Aspen and you want a specific week, like you can do that. Yeah, you, you don't can have do to that. like own a timeshare. And I also something we didn't have time to really dive into too much in the episode, but is like another, I think, under under understood aspect of timeshare of the timeshare strategy um, that I certainly wasn't aware of. But so I'm going to be vague here, but I know someone whose family has a timeshare in a specific location where essentially everyone from their area has a timeshare in this location. Like, because the timeshare companies, especially, you know, a few decades ago, when there wasn't the internet and there wasn't as much of a way to, you know, sort of diffuse the marketing as thoroughly as it has been, like they would set up shop in specific areas and target that community, target those regions to all go to one place. And part of the appeal was like, you go there, they have restaurants that cater to local tastes from the original region. You have all the people that you know from your hometown or, you know, you basically you get to have everything you love about home, but transplanted to, you know, an impoverished Caribbean island, basically. Um, and I think if you're not familiar with the timeshare system, like that seems, to me, that seems sort of like in many ways the opposite of vacation, which, you know, for I think a lot of people, vacation is about sort of leaving your um, your day-to-day -day experience and doing something different. Um, but for a lot of people, and I think Disney sort of perfected this model, it was about the exact opposite. It's yes. about your leisure time should just be a very optimized version of the thing that you already know and want. If I'm only getting two weeks of vacation, and how lucky if you have two weeks of a vacation and you can afford to go somewhere, Disney is like, we have spent billions of dollars and decades packing this with things people might like and perfecting them. And so like, if you can't find something, that's probably a you problem. So everyone's like, I think feels like they can get their bang for their buck. But the truth is, Disney is wildly overpriced, especially if you do a timeshare model. Right. Um, and it is not, I don't find it to be, and I'm a Disney fan, I'm a theme park enthusiast. I don't find it to be a great vacation option for families at this point. Like, I mean, if you're very, very wealthy, you'll have a great time. But other than that, other than saying it is a good vacation, it, I can't like recommend people go to Disney World because the prices are insane. Hotel prices are absolutely outrageous you have to now make like reservations for certain parks and then reserve all the rides and where you're going to eat and build in like extra costs for getting ahead on lines and stuff so you think you're you're spending a certain amount of money, but because you have to make all these reservations early, it's not like you can be in the park and be like, oh, I'll just get quick service because I've been spending a lot today. You were really committing to spending thousands of dollars a day to really have that experience. And so uh, the Disney Vacation Club is a great way to say to families like, you know, here's a way to lock in that you'll get this experience. But the truth is, like, I don't think most people, after they go on a couple vacations to a really beloved spot, want to go there every year all the time. And even with a regular timeshare, getting in that week and getting to pick the week is not it's a moving, it's like shooting a dart at a bee. They're always like, well, we have some people coming in. It's too early to book. It's too late to book. It's not the right season. Or if you do book, we have to downgrade the room in this instance because it's last minute. Like there's always rules and the rules are ever changing and they're different for different timeshare companies. So they end up most of the time not even giving you what you paid for, let alone if what you paid for is worth it. And so I, I don't know, it's vacations especially are, are really prime for exploitation when the economy is hurting. Because people are desperate for them. They're desperate for them. And I think also, you know, when you think again about the ways in which timeshares will target specific communities, like what they're also replicating that Disney does so well is the feeling that everyone else is doing it. And Disney has the even more powerful sort of a, they can apply an even more powerful pressure because it's children who are seeing it. And you know, I never went to Disney, for example. I've never been to Disney World, Disneyland, anything like that. And I remember as a child, I felt very excluded. I felt like I was really missing out on something. I was constantly like begging and harassing my parents. And we even lived in South Florida for part of my childhood. And it just like, it just wasn't accessible and it wasn't a priority. And I, looking back, totally understand that. But I think it's also totally normal when you add in this 
complete cultural saturation that like there is a real perception and we do talk in the episode about you know the debt that families will go into yes. and the universal pressure that is experienced that like there Disney very clearly cultivates an ambiance where if you are not giving your child the Disney experience you're somehow being a neglectful parent yeah the the great thing about marketing to parents is that they're running out of time all the time right and so you're like if my kids Get, makes it to 12 and they've never been to Disney World, what kind of a parent am I? Right. And that's absurd. That's really silly. Like, no no child needs to visit this corporate location as part of their development. And the social pressure creates an environment where they feel like they do. And as a family that went to Disney regularly, but also on the cheap all the time, like, my parents went to Disney. They were like, we're going to spend – you're getting one – Souvenir. <laughs> we're going to spend two days at the parks and we're going to stay at the cheapest place because I'm not going to be like my parents were not going to be like taken advantage of. But th- what really that really creates is that if you can't even make it, you just end up, especially nowadays, excluded from things. You have to wait in line longer. You can't go to the nice restaurants that have interactive show features. So it feels like you're missing a ride because you can't expect you can't afford the expense of that r- additional ride, essentially. You more days you can spend, the more you can do meet and greets. So if you're like with a little kid, meet and greets are available at certain times during the week. So if you wanted to say have the full experience, and and of course it's a difficult job to pull off for Disney. Like it, it's always been difficult. But the truth is that it was affordable for families at one point. That's how it got this reputation. Disney was a really great vacation option for people, like especially to stay domestically. A lot of um, Americans don't really travel abroad um they really because we're such a large country and it is so expensive for us a lot of families stay domestically and disney is a big reason for that and they have now become a luxury brand but similar to people like apple they're a luxury brand with really accessible points of entry right you can become a disney fan with just a disney plus subscription for your kids but when you introduce it it is so overwhelming the amount of products that disney licenses is so absolutely absurd there's no quality control um and so once you kind of bring it into your life it they really have targeted that vacation thing down to like you have in the next five years you have to give us ten thousand dollars which is a crazy thing to say to someone who's trying to afford kids and schools and camps and, and like, healthcare. yeah for literally what is at the end of the day a swamp <laughs> in Orlando that they built a very, very nice set of rides on. You know, go to Fort Lauderdale. It's really nice and right next door. <laughs> um, so in turn, like, kind of on that note, another episode that I really loved um, was about sort of the TikTok Airbnb hustlers, um, which I think is just a really, um, it's a phenomenon that has been, I think it's, it's grafted onto the pandemic in a very, very strange way because we saw you know, Airbnb has obviously been uh, fairly ascendant over the past decade. I think a lot of that is, you know, really aggressive VC funding, regulation not being able to keep up with it in terms of where Airbnbs are placed and who can have them and all that stuff. Um, But then during the pandemic, we saw kind of the risks associated with having, you know, rental properties that, you know, if if people suddenly aren't traveling, you're kind of Um, And yet I think a lot of people are still really sort of emotionally tied to this idea of rental properties specifically as a a growth hack for wealth. And interestingly, thinking of it as a form of passive income, although arguably owning and maintaining a rental property, like anything but passive. Um, But I'd be interested, you know, especially from someone who views things more through like a tech, pop culture, social media lens, like what is your take on this issue and specifically how social media factors into its popularity? I think people are really desperate for certain kinds of information or advice when times are bad and snackable, entertaining power fantasies that you don't even go looking for. TikTok just brings to you. It is it is a temptation to go down to this mindset of like, I mean, the truth is that in capitalism, like owning things is way more profitable than doing things. And so people are this is a really what seems like an easy, understandable, relatable way to like. And and plus, you get to form this parasocial relationship with someone who is what you want to be. They seem relaxed. They seem in control. And they seem like they're like letting you in on like a secret. And all of those elements are always really infectious on social media. 
And add on top of that, that being a landlord can be very profitable at a certain level without much work on behalf of the landlord. But that is not what you're getting involved in most of the time, unless you have a ton of capital going in. And also, like, maybe think about that as a problem and not just how can I exploit people the way that this other person is, you know. But I think that that requires people to have a lot of time and energy and um, support that they don't feel right now. And so these people can just through the power of TikTok pushing them in your face, these people can come in and sell you a fantasy. Um, and generally, they do want to sell you stuff. You'll find that a lot of those personalities are pushing courses. Mm. Or they've been taken in themselves. You'll find years later that they're like, actually, owning a bunch of vending machines sucks. I actually don't like doing this because it's a hard job. I The coarsification of this content in particular is so frustrating because it feels like they're – because at least with, you know, when it comes to the TikTok gurus, like at least if you have the responsibility of like owning and maintaining a bunch of rental properties in like, you know, Florida or whatever, I mean, at, at the end of the day, there's there's a PL, right? Like yeah. there's a profit and loss statement there. Like you're subject to all kinds of external market and environmental and regulatory factors. Like, to some and, and you can break the law. A lot of people, a lot of landlords do break the law. But then you're bringing in a ton of um, risk. You're bringing in all these variables that something is going to go wrong, and then you will be financially liable. And you're also being an awful person. But then when it, <laughs> but then when it extends to the course layer of hell, when you're into the course circle of hell, like the one layer below, it's like. There's hardly any regulation. There's nope. no oversight. There's no real assessment of whether or not what you're doing is working. There's only your marketing, essentially. I mean, you're, it's like Trump University. They bring people in and then they repeat either basic facts or like how to scam in a gray area legally. And they stretch this information out and they usually include with it a bunch of other sales tactics to buy, get you to buy more courses or like entry into their programs or I, you see a lot... This is a lot of men content. A lot of men. It brings in a lot of men, I would say. Well, and it's also, there's something about it that is so counterintuitive to the way real wealth is built in the sense that, you know, when you look at, for example, so there's no more reliable and stable form of passive wealth generation than investing in the market. And yeah. amongst that, nothing more than, you know, investing broadly in index funds that, you know, follow the market, essentially not picking individual stocks, not trying to game it or time it. Like you basically set it and forget it. And over the course, through the miracle of compound interest, over the course of many years, you'll make a lot of money from a fairly small initial investment. Like that's, there's no mystery. We've established it. We have a hundred years worth of market data. If you want to generate passive income and also truly have it be passive in the sense that you're not actually doing anything, like that's the way. And yet, whether it is with these rental properties or, you know, picking stocks, there is something. And I do think that it's like you said, it's very male oriented, this feeling that you're always better off if you're doing something. Yes, 100 percent. Which is the opposite of how money works. Because it is you're you're right. It, it is completely counterintuitive to the way that actual real big generational wealth is built, especially in this country. Uh, it, but it is aesthetically what mm. they're – it's similar to and what they're selling you. And it looks like, you know, people who earn a lot of money, say in the financial district, are also wearing suits and going to meetings and running around. But I think that the difference, especially with a real estate scam, is that they, they don't explain to you – real estate has been made into a way of wealth building in this country. It's been like – the story's been told even despite housing bubbles collapsing or redlining or like things that should disqualify it as a wealth building instrument that's like reliable. Um, there's also like – I mean, look what happened to a lot of people in Ohio – I mean, mm. th those their property values have completely collapsed because of an environmental disaster that they have literally no control over. And you know, say you have an, uh, an Airbnb and you or you own a bunch of short-term rental uh, units in somewhere like Orlando. You're like, lots of people visit. This is going to be really sustainable. I can just set my price point to whatever the market will bear, and I just need to clean the place up and keep it in good repair or whatever. But the truth is, you can't account for everything that's going to happen. Mm. You can't account for when Disney. Um, jacks up its prices or, or the brand goes sour or there is a natural disaster or like, you know, the politics in Florida make it more difficult to do what you want to do. And, 
you know, if, if say Ron DeSantis comes in like an act of God and says, you know, it, there's these crazy tolls to even get into Disney, it's going to affect your sales to lower income people and or to, you know, middle income people, which is usually the market for Airbnbs and and at this level. And I think people don't understand the amount of risk they're taking on. But it's because the social media selling of it is really aesthetically in line with wealth, wealth building. And the social media stuff can, can leave out all the problems. I mean, you edit down a TikTok from what? It's not even like a YouTube video where like maybe you could at some point contradict yourself. In three minutes, most people are just spitting out sales pitches. I mean, I do think, unfortunately, although I do use it, um, TikTok's probably not good for society or our brains. I think TikTok has lots of really great uses. I genuinely do think that it has use cases. I just don't think (laughs) if someone's trying to sell you something or give you like, I want to say like, if someone's trying to get you to change jobs via TikTok, if someone's asking you for money via TikTok, if someone's suggesting you invest in a significant portion of your income on TikTok, that's not, they don't have your back, bud. Like, that's not the place for networking. You're not, even on LinkedIn, you should be highly suspicious of someone being like, hey, I have a great way for you to make a ton of money. Why would someone want to give that to you? Why would they not just do that? Well, it goes back to the very title of our podcast. It's too good to be true. <laughs> too good to be true. We're excited to once again be partnering with Nutrafol here on the Financial Confessions. We actually talk about Nutrafol a lot around the office since our marketing director, Rachel, started using it earlier this year. To be totally honest, hair growth is not something that personally affects me, so I'm happy that we found a product that has had a positive impact for someone else on our team. We all know men experience hair loss, but many women do too, even though it's not as openly spoken about. But here at TFD, we tend to speak pretty openly with each other, and Rachel has openly spoken a lot about dealing with postpartum hair loss, as well as general changes in her hair texture and thickness since giving birth. After all of her other postpartum symptoms subsided, it's the one that has remained the longest. She's changed up the product she uses and stopped applying heat like hair dryers and curling irons completely, but nothing has made a real impact. She started taking four Nutrafol capsules every morning with breakfast and says she can already see a difference in the amount of hair she's shedding. We love that for her. Nutrafol supports healthy hair growth from within by targeting the five root causes of thinning, stress, hormones, environment, nutrition, and metabolism through whole body health. And in a clinical study, 86% of women reported improved hair growth after six months. You can grow thicker, healthier hair and support our show by going to Nutrafol.com and entering the promo code TFC to save $10 off your first month subscription. This offer is only available to U.S. customers for a limited time, plus free shipping on every order. Get $10 off at Nutrafol.com, spelled N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L.com, promo code TFC. I want to take a quick pause and thank today's sponsor, ZocDoc. If there's one thing you should actually take the time to do, it's find yourself a good doctor, whether it's for your mental health, your yearly checkup, or a new dentist because you're still going to the same one from your childhood and realize you don't actually like them. Finding the right doctor should not be an overwhelming task. It should actually be the opposite. ZocDoc is the only free app that lets you find and book doctors who are patient-reviewed, take your insurance, are available when you need them, and treat almost every condition under the sun. Instead of going to TikTok for medical advice, no shade because you know I love TikTok, it's just not where I nor you should be seeking out medical advice, I use ZocDoc, literally, I personally do use it, to find the right medical professionals, and you should too. Like I said, I actually use ZocDoc, and honestly, it has been really, really helpful to just keep that entire part of my life totally organized, as it's something that can easily feel overwhelming and become an item on your to-do list that just kind of lingers there forever and gives you anxiety. ZocDoc is honestly the GOAT. And if for whatever reason you're not feeling your best, finding the right care shouldn't take up all your time and energy. That's where ZocDoc comes in to help. Using their free app that millions of users rely on, you can find the right doctor that meets your needs and fits your busy schedule. Here in New York City, some doctors are booked up for weeks, if not months in advance, and that's not particularly helpful when you have something that needs timely attention. With ZocDoc, you can book an appointment with a few taps in their app and choose from thousands of patient-reviewed doctors and specialists, browse doctor profiles, upload and verify your insurance information, and get the care you need in one place. Go to ZocDoc.com TFC and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then book a top-rated doctor today. Many are available within 24 hours. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash TFC. ZocDoc.com slash TFC. So another episode that is very near and dear to my heart as a girly who famously has not driven a car in about a decade um, and is a, a little urban cyclist, uh, I think it's what it's called, um, is the episode on car culture and how it's just 
torpedoing our country. I mean, it's crazy that we have, to the degree that we have, incorporated cars, which are an enormous financial burden on people, but also like really bad for the environment. And 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 you look at how that happened, and it's like crazy. Like you look at how cars took over New York, and it was like one guy was like, "I like cars. I'm going to bring cars to every quarter of this city." And it's it's we're coming on, you know, a century. And seeing the results of that, and it is really scary. And and I think actually the biggest takeaway from the car culture episode for me was like, we're our infrastructure is built around this. We have to find ways to work with that infrastructure that already exists to replace cars, obviously, and, and we should be promoting public transit. But to a certain extent, cars are just kind of baked into our equation for the next 50, 100 years of our society. And there's such a draw. There is such a draw, but if you look at a lot of European cities, what is heartening is that like a lot of them used to be choked by cars as yeah. well, especially in like this, if you look at photos from the 60s, 70s, like it was, it is policy choices. Now, don't get me wrong. It is to some extent easier for, you know, more dense urban environments to be pedestrian and bike focused, but what about trains bud like why don't we have trains is the really crazy thing the truth is i mean the reason i think we don't have a lot of public goods is because you know in in, during the civil rights movement white people didn't want to be in group areas and private companies would offer you discrimination that you couldn't get elsewhere and i think that still happens to a certain degree but you look at places like disney world or las vegas or i mean any vacation destination new york it is people wanting to cosplay What is a great life, which is the 15 minute city with like, you know, dense urban areas with really great public planning. You look at Disney World, it is literally a fake main street with fake things to do and fake restaurants with really great public transit. And everybody has to pay, of course, a cost of entry. But that cost of entry isn't actually that high to support all of those, all the infrastructure. You look at even downtown Disney is like an amazing place to spend a day. And I think people are buying into that as a vacation idea without realizing like, Hey, the stuff that's really nice every day you're on vacation, wouldn't that be nice at home? Like everyone has this idea that they need to live, a a lot of people, not everyone, obviously I live in a very densely packed place, but a lot of people in this country have this idea that they need to have this enormous amount of distance between themselves and any community, which I think is not just isolating, but like it's, it looks like, it looks like abundance, but really it's, it's a kind of scarcity. We have a loneliness epidemic. Uh, Totally. And I think, you know, the loneliness part of it and how much it affects, for example, older people and people as they become less like, you know, they'll they'll refer often to these places that are neither work nor home that people gather as the third spaces. And a lot of areas simply don't have them. And the few that they do have often, A, they're centered around alcohol, which is not accessible or optimal for many people. Um, But also B, they're places that you have to drive to and from if you don't have a car or don't have multiple cars. They're just not something you can get to. And again, especially as people age and are no longer, let's say, for example, in school and offices and places where there's a lot of socializing kind of naturally occurring, like... There is a massive, massive mental health issue associated with people being so far apart from each other physically. Um, And I do think until Americans start to demand the kinds of interconnected communities that we see in other countries are really beneficial. And I think, quite frankly, frame it as a public health issue because it's not just the mental health, that's part of it. But like the fact that people have no other option but to drive most places in the country, like, that's really bad for health. I mean, just, you're talking about the third place thing. That's a huge draw on people's mental health. It's a huge draw on morale, networking. Like, it's it's a total loss for us. But it also, you have to think about it from the perspective of, like, it's also another set of eyes in your life. Like, when we saw family members more often and, and we had closer-knit communities, Children were cared for by a whole bunch of people, and they could weigh in on what was happening. Similar to your finances, you can say to people, I have this crazy business opportunity to purchase a bridge. And someone at your, like, neighborhood bar or your neighborhood community center or, like, a sports team. Or a church. Or a church can weigh in and say, like, hey, don't do that. And that could save you from problems. And that kind of isolation... It leaves a lot of empty space in your life and and something will fill a vacuum. And social media especially has come in and said, like, guess what? I'll fill all of those vacuums. Like anything you are interested in, I will provide you with information on. But 
we have to remember that, that those are systems that can be gamed rather than like a community that you build that's not as easy to like infiltrate with scams. Well, and also social media comes in and says, I'll replace all those things. And because you are not seeing very much of the people around you in a natural and, you know, kind of extemporaneous way, I'm going to paint the most diabolical caricature-ish version of these things and people you don't know. Like, basically everyone in my family thinks that I live in a war zone. Like, yeah, they think that I walk around every day in a bulletproof vest and I'm like, rep- I'm like a journalist in a war zone that's having to like duck behind dumpsters with the rats to avoid sprays <laughs> of gunfire. And I'm like, you think I'd be living in that? Like, what? I'm happening? hesitant to say her name, but Marjorie Taylor Greene the other day on TV was just like, it's a a shithole it's a dirt it's a filthy rat invested and it was like you're in midtown babe like i don't know what if you're if you've never been to new york that's totally cool midtown literally looks like a spider-man movie like it's it's a friendly neighbor like it, there's so much abundance there that it couldn't help but be so beautiful and I, it's very strange that that to me a lot of people live in this bubble that is unpierceable because like Even when you see things through social media, you can choose to decide what is true and what isn't, right? Mm. So you can choose to decide that a real estate scam that you get is true or that New York is really dirty because that's what feels right to you. And then everyone else can be a liar and you can caricature them and you can make these cartoon character sort of figures without any real thought process. And I'll see this on stuff like I, I follow a lot of for work. I follow a lot of really specific or niche subreddits. And it for a lot of the a lot of it is for me to kind of see I want to see like what subcultures are doing, the way people are talking about specific issues, how things are interconnected. And you'll see in really niche subreddits where there's really authoritarian speakers on like biochemistry. They will get a basic pop culture fact wrong, basic literature wrong, references to things wrong. But it because those communities are hyper niche, you can feel like you're amongst experts and really actually not be. Mm. And there, it's also really, really easy to cosplay as those things because you can go into sort of those communities, adopt some of the aesthetics, and then pretend to be an expert. The internet obfuscates all of these relationships in ways that I don't think people even have the time to grapple with. Well, and I also think that part of what social media drives that feeds really into, you know, ultimately, and part of what we talked about in the episode is that car culture, to take it back to that, is sort of by definition sprawl culture. Like, yeah. cars necessitate sprawl, sprawls necessitate cars. And, you know, we've talked a lot before on the channel about how, for example, like the average home size has gone way up over the years, even as families have gotten smaller. Like, we now want more and more just sheer sort of material objects in our lives more than we ever have we expect more than we've ever expected and in order to service that you need a a lot of room and you need big cars to haul it around and i you know there have been a lot like again I'm, i'm fairly new to tiktok but one of the things i notice is how much a culture of really and i want to i I hesitate to use the word abundance because I mean it in a negative sense and it is consumerism, but it's just, for example, you know, there's the fast fashion halls, there's the cosmetic halls, there's all of that culture of just accumulating a lot of low quality stuff. But then even, you know, it's become really popular at the time of filming over the past few weeks, you know, to post photos of yourself making these elaborate waters that have like flavor packets and syrups and things like that. And the the videos open up with someone opening a cabinet to like 15 of those, you know, really expensive water tumblers or, you know, a hugely popular subgenre is like just like the fridge restocking oh videos God, yes. or the kitchen restocking, the pantry restocking. Those are scams like every other scam. <laughs> They're scams, but it's also like I, w- what's so mind boggling to me about it. First of all, the single use plastics alone. Good I mean, Lord. Or the little individual gadgets that do one hyper specific thing and they're very cheaply made. And by the way, there's a the referral link and the whatever and I mean the amount of spending you would need to do to live in these insane and the time the upkeep of transferring foods into little containers it's I mean it's literally just for social media nobody I mean nobody living I think a healthy sustainable life without a staff of 12 actually lives like that but I do think it it becomes a vicious cycle of informing people's perspectives of what their fridges should look like like it's it's normalizing for example like the people these people have whole 
like convenience stores in their home and it's normalizing how much of that it's even normal to have that size of a pantry that you should stock it a certain way like i think that it's like to me as we continue to see the size like look at the size to take it back to cars look at the size of the the new ford f-150s how they've gotten bigger over the yeah. years like we cannot deny the connection of seeing such unbridled consumption and acquisition with the need to stock and transport it all well we like trained people into thinking they need all these products they have to have them and then we like in we introduced uh, social media which is just a way of like it's a power fantasy again of like that's how a lot of scams go of like look if i could have every color every eye shadow shave every lip lipstick shape what if i had every single food like all the kinds of ice all the flavored waters all that stuff it's like look if if, if i it, what it would be like to have all of this stuff and then you feel this pressure because also social media elevates two kinds of people there's influencers and there's the rest of us and if you wanted to get into there like I used to never make any content in my home because I didn't think it was very aesthetically pleasing it was just kind of what I could afford I got it out of college I wasn't going to paint because I was new I want to always wanted to move if the chance ever came up and I wasn't investing in it but it meant I like didn't do this whole kind of self-expression that a lot of people did and because I didn't feel like welcomed in that way I felt this pressure to be able to afford going places where I could take a selfie or like, and it is really artificial and it does sound really shallow to me now, but yet that those are the things when you're young, those are there. You are shallow there. Those are the things that do trick you because it is, it seems like, so, um, it seems so like, well, if you, if you had any self awareness or like self confidence, you wouldn't feel like pressured in that way. But most people don't. And, and that's, fair and fine to admit I only follow people on Instagram that I really know or are drag artists for like inspiration and community because I do drag I don't follow like thirst trap people I don't follow a lot of aspirational people I don't ask or welcome a lot of that into my life because I was realizing how much it really was getting to me even if I was aware of it not getting to, like aware of it and saying like I don't I'll never be pressured into feeling like I need to be thin and then like being like feeling very pressured it reminds me of that episode that we recorded in 2020 when we, it was like people were just starting to like emerge from their homes oh, yeah. and we talked about the like the photos that it was like the first nice day in April and like there were in like Washington Square Park or wherever they were like there were just like all these people in like essentially bikinis and speedos in the park just you know sitting out there having their drinks and it was like there was something so grotesque about like this is this is it. This is the first thing we have to see coming out of like a pandemic where in New York City, like there were, you know, they literally had to store bodies on the street and in, in refrigerated trucks because there weren't enough room for them. The first thing that we have to look at, the first thing that people want to do is to go out in public and make sure that everyone knows that they didn't gain weight during yeah. this time. And there was something and like, and the fact that that was so much of what was on social media at that time. And there was like, did you gain the pandemic 15 or whatever? And it's like, it truly, I, that was, I, I nearly went Joker at that point. I was like, I can't take this mentally. I mean, that was really, and I think you have these moments where it is super revealing. I mean, I, I see a lot of like, I think aesthetics stuff has been great for art, like to be like, I have this specific aesthetic, this core. That's been cool for art. And I think like every time we develop words around this stuff or ways to get young people interested in, in art and expression, that's like so awesome. Uh, creativity is amazing. But it has become a subculture of like, does it look the part? And and so sometimes it's cheap, like it looks the part, but it actually doesn't function or it's not going to last. But if it looks the part and it can help you complete the whole picture, which is the whole room, the whole outfit, the whole like lifestyle every day. I don't think we had that pressure before. Like I wore outfits that looked nice. And of course, I wanted like a nice design in my home. But if you don't have a new home decor every year or whatever and it, it, it what do you you want you know people want to photograph they want to show all that stuff off and it goes I think from like a point of being a, an interest that you have to like a desperation because if you can afford it and it's something you're interested in of course style and fashion is great but people feel this pressure to engage with with fast fashion just to keep up on social media oh. and so they're ordering you know you need a new or you need 20 new outfits in the month minimum to do your like new outfit every day, going out looks, photo shoot, whatever for something that isn't your career. It's just a form of self-expression, but it becomes this like hamster cycle of consumption. And if you're putting in a lot and not getting something out, I mean, that's the too good to be true thing. And I think it like, it's all part of a whole. 
but right now I think economically and like legislatively and like even socially how we interact with each other has not kept up with our tech advances, which have happened at a rate of like, if you look historically, like a rate I never seen before in history. And I think, you know, people are really struggling to pull all the pieces of like the, how the economy has changed, how the technology has changed, how our social interactions have changed, how gender expectations have changed. All of that is happening really fast. And I think my only hope is that I think when I talk to people in Gen Z and I don't feel I feel the whole generations thing is very overstated and boomer jokes are funny, but there are lots of great boomers. But I do think that I hear from younger people a more of a sense of getting it, of like understanding all these pieces and feeling like a sense of being inoculated against a lot of the ways that things work. And they shouldn't have to be like we can create a world where we don't need to constantly be on the defense of scams and like, you know, abuse online. But you know, I, I think that they see it all and they talk about it in a way that other generations just haven't been able to yet, haven't had the mm. time. And so maybe that's hopeful to me is that it's harder to scam younger people right now. Well, but that's only because they're assaulted with scams all day. Well, and I think, I mean, to to kind of tie it with the last video or the last episode that I think is, is really strong and, and is slightly more sort of like technical financial one is... Part of the reason I think that like all of these restocking videos and stuff like that are so massively popular is because we're in a cost of living crisis where, you know, these basic household items have become luxury goods and we no longer necessarily need to see someone. And the episode is about inflation, cost of living, what these things are, why it's happening, you know, all of that kind of stuff. But from a more sort of emotional perspective, like people are feeling their quality of life be squeezed in a way that is like I feel, I don't know how you feel about this, but I feel multiple times a week when I'm buying something that I've bought forever at Dwayne Reed or, you know, the at Fairway or whatever, like, I'm like, oh, what? When I look at the price, like, I feel like it's exploded in price and I no longer, and I don't know how and I don't know where. And it's, you feel like you don't know which brands are just totally taking advantage versus which ones, you know, have seen their costs rise, all that kind of stuff. But it does seem striking now that a lot of the most aspirational content is about, really banal stuff because that's what's becoming luxurious well also the rich feel it's ostentatious and off-putting they've they've realized to be like look i'm on my super yacht and i'm gonna you know spill champagne on it because i don't even care like that looks dumb now you look silly you look out of touch and they know that so that's on their finsta but what you see from like wealthy people as their public pr nowadays especially wealthy younger people is like an incognito olsen twin thing where they're like i live in a beautiful apartment but i never show it to you you just see me on the new york street just like you or like i this is me at my coffee shop just a neighborhood place i go but of course it's aspirational and super wealthy and photographs amazing um you see a lot of like i'm you know <laughs> there was a really great I love drag. I'm going to bring it up again. There was a really great bit from a drag queen named Alaska where she was pretending to be. Remember when Lady Gaga dra- did that Joanne era? Mm-hmm. It was all dressed down. I'm just in denim and a, and a pink cowboy hat. Um, Alaska would wear just the most aspirational version of cut off denim and a pink cowboy hat and just be like, I'm just a regular girl. And that was her whole impression of Lady Gaga. And it was Lady Gaga trying to bring it back down to regular to like relate to fans or to show another side of herself. And I think... Um, it didn't resonate because we all know that she has access to more than that and and likes making bigger things than that. And it felt understated because we want the show. And I think rich people right now are very much trying to reset our expectations for their show so that mm. they have this presentation of themselves as like, I'm just a human being. Look, I'm just a human being. I might be a billionaire, but I'm just like you. And like, I'm a stakeholder. Aren't you a stakeholder? This like evening this equalizing language and i'm not falling for it i know you're a lizard person (laughs) well and also i mean it's a tough time it's a tough time to be a billionaire now it's hard to look chic um but i think even like there is this weird sort of uncanny valley of upper middle class and it's not even clear like when i watch those videos the restocking videos for Mm. example It's hard for me to pinpoint because, again, to take it back to the suburban sprawl thing, like you can live in a very big house without a lot of money. You can get into these mortgages not as easily as you used to be able to, but you still can. You you can have a house that's, you know, made out of particle board, but is 4,000 square feet and, you know, on a postage stamp of land. You can have, you can lease a car that you can't really afford for a ton of money. Like 
you can have all of the trappings of a much wealthier life. And I sort of look at the aesthetic that seems, and I think it's honestly more prevalent amongst millennials aspiring to this aesthetic than it is Gen Z. But you look at this aesthetic and there's this weird sort of like, whereas I feel like the wealthy and the celebrities and the people who, to your point, are spilling champagne on the yacht, that used to be the most aspirational. Now it's this sort of uncanny valley of like, they live in a nice suburban home that's bigger than what I have, but not too big. And they maybe don't have, you know, the Birkin bag, but they have 20 of those Usually pastels. Usually they do, and it's shoved in the closet. But even if they at their don't, farmhouse. Th- they have 20 of those Stanley tumblers. Yeah, oh, totally. I mean, and there's also the thing of like, when we talk about the wealthy, and, and it's probably a little confusing up until this point in the podcast, there's a difference between like upper middle class, upper class, and the wealthy. Right. And so like, when the wealthy are bringing down their public presentations and the Kardashians are like, let's reel it in a little, guys, um, just for taste, um, you... It, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that upper middle class or middle class people are going to do that. If anything, they're probably going to go in the other direction to be like, you know, look, things are so like whatever they are, but look how I'm living. Look how I still have. I'm on vacation. I'm still having a vibrant life, whatever. You feel this pressure to like overstate how things are. And I think, I mean, there's this great genre. There's this great TikToker. I don't know um, his name. But he does the I'm rich, you're poor. Have you seen uh, those? Oh, my God. You're it's a amazing. pavo. He's taught me the <laughs> yeah. word pavo. He's like, I have nine kinds of ice. You don't even care what kind of ice you have because I'm rich and you're poor. And they're I really funny. Him. He's great. But they only – he is making fun of people who are excited about being rich. They're like, I am – rich now like I have these things or I or look I look I live I know regular people but I'm the rich one like I think there's a certain psychology people who are born and raised with the kind of insane generational wealth are not making videos like that they're not advertising any of that and so it kind of is like you know no matter who you're talking to about wealth they're you, you're not always going to get the, the straight story and they're probably lying to you I mean we have a real honesty problem around wealth and like emotional relationships that are really complicated and social media has scrambled it all up and we're all starting over. Totally. And I think that having, being in a cost of living crisis and having day-to-day essentials become luxury items makes it so that there is an entirely new aspirational class that's just people who can afford to have a lot of those single-use plastic packaged food items and not care. Or even just like the one step above, like the like mukbang videos where it's like, I can go to a fast food store and purchase every kind of thing on the menu and try it all. And like you can live vicariously through it. And Take it's, two bites, but, set it down. Yeah. You're not a billionaire, but you're practicing a worship of wealth and a consumption style. And you're... I mean, it, it's, it, I mean, why would you engage, to me, why would you engage with ideas that have clearly harmed you so much? But I think people are not that evolved in their emotional relationship with money. They just want to feel a certain way. And I think that social media, like, especially feeds on how you feel. I mean, it's like the health crisis. People want to feel taken care of and supported. And essential oils may not actually do anything for you and supplements may not do anything for you. But the guy at GNC doesn't charge you anything to talk to you about your health. He will sit there and he'll listen when you say you can't sleep and he'll give you something that maybe you can't always afford. But if it's $40, you can scrape it together, a lot of people. And it doesn't work. And it's a waste of your time and money. But people want to feel that. And that's how all this stuff creeps in. It's all part of a whole. Disney does the same thing to you. They're like, you're a great parent because you spent 10 grand. We didn't have time to get to it, but the essential oils episode also uh, absolutely bangs. So uh, we've ha- we have four episodes we've released of this season. Those will all be linked as well as season one's episodes. We have four more yet to come on the other side of this episode. Um, the show is called Too Good to Be True. It airs here on Mondays in place of TFC. And if people want to watch your channel, where do they go? Please go to youtube.com slash at Ryho, R-Y-H-O. Lots of content upcoming. Like, please subscribe. Just play it in the background. The support. This is what we want to see. The support. Write a script that just automatically refreshes it over and over. That would be great. Totally. And then, you know, something that texts everyone in your phone. That would be amazing. Yes. Start (laughs) spamming your loved ones. But seriously, go check it out. It's amazing stuff that will also be linked. Uh, Like, comment, subscribe. And we will see you here next Monday for the next episode of Too Good to Be True. Bye, guys. Mm -hmm.